Clifton was purchased at the end of the 19th century by William Waldorf Astor, one of the wealthiest men in America. He and the Astor family settled quickly in England and soon became part of the British aristocracy. In 1906, William gave Clifton House to his son Waldorf and his American wife Nancy Langhorne as a wedding gift. Nancy and her husband gave Clifton a new lease of life. They entertained on a lavish scale. The house quickly became a destination for film stars and politicians, such as Charlie Chaplin, Gandhi and Winston Churchill. Nancy Astor, the first Lady Astor, came from the American South, and shortly after her arrival here, she became a figure of great interest. Everybody wanted to know her. She was only five feet high, yet on all accounts she was both beautiful and very intelligent. Both the young Astors were actively involved in politics, and they saw themselves as being a lot more liberal than the former more conservative Lord Astor. And it would be Nancy who went on to become the more famous of the two. In 1919, just one year after women were given the right to vote and become a member of Parliament, Nancy Astor, to a fanfare of worldwide publicity, made history. She became the first woman to take a seat as an MP for the Conservative Party. Women had died for the vote. Mrs. Pankhurst and that woman who threw herself before the thing. And I was, and I, I realized that I was there because of what they'd done. I've come to the Lady Astor bedroom to meet Sue Williams, general manager here at Clifton, to hear more about Nancy's political life. So what was she like, you know, outside of politics, as a person? She is written up in, as a tale of two halves. She had a big heart, but with her own family and things, she was very, very tough. And in politics, what was she like? Her real aim was to improve the welfare for families. Uh, so that would cover everything from education, health, living accommodations. And actually, it is Nancy who brought in our drinking laws of today, which are uh, oh, I didn't the legal. Know that. Really? Uh, yeah, being able to drink over the age of 18. So, how is Nancy treated in the House of Commons upon her election? Her attributes really offended all the male politicians that she kind of was working alongside. Her whole style was just, just tenacious. I mean, my best friends didn't speak to me uh, hardly. They couldn't. It's like going into a member's club. I mean, an all-male club. All-male club. And I was very conscious of that. She was controversial. They really shunned her and wouldn't speak to her barely at all. They wouldn't sort of open doors and stand up for her to move along the benches and things like that. They didn't disagree, many of them, and certainly this is a position for Winston Churchill. He didn't disagree with the vote for women and women in politics, but he didn't care for some of the more aggressive tactics that they would use. Nancy and Churchill were... They didn't they, get on? They, they did not get on at all. And there was this one wonderful occasion that is well recorded. And Nancy was so wound up by him, she said, Sir, if you were my husband, I'd poison your coffee. And he came back with his razor sharp wit and said, Mom, if you're my wife, uh, I would drink it. You know, <laughs> wonderful sort of put you down with just wit and intelligence. Lady Astor died at the age of 84. Her life at Clifton and her involvement in British politics meant she left a lasting impression and legacy. Thanks to the next generation of Astors, the parties at Clifton continued throughout the 50s and 60s. And it was in 1961 that a meeting took place here that rocked the British establishment. It was the height of the Cold War, and the building of the Berlin Wall had created a divide between East and West. This was the backdrop to a meeting that put Clifton at the centre of political life for the second time in a century. Now, a frequent visitor of the Astors here at Clifton in the early 1960s was a successful Harley Street osteopath called Stephen Ward. He'd massaged the backs of the rich and the famous, people like Winston Churchill, the royal family, Elizabeth Taylor, but he also specialised in introducing beautiful women to powerful and influential men who attended parties here at Clifton. Stephen Ward had friends in high places, including the British Secret Service's MI5, and Ward would frequently stay here in Spring Cottage on the estate, and he'd arrive with handfuls of gorgeous young women by his side. One of these women was a model, 19-year-old Christine Keeler. And on one summer's evening at the Clifton Swimming Pool in July 1961, she caught the eye of the Conservative Member of Parliament and Secretary of War, John Profumo. 
The minister became smitten with the model and they began a three-month affair. Perfumer's affair would have probably remained unknown if it hadn't been for the arrival here at the swimming pool of a handsome Russian spy called Evgeny Ivanov. Now, the very same weekend that Ward introduced Ivanov to Christine Keeler here, later on that evening, John Perfumo turned up on the scene and the inevitable happened. The Russian spy met up with the British Secretary of State for War, John Perfumo. And shortly after that, the circle was complete. Ivanov also had an affair with Christine Keeler. Now, I know this is beginning to sound like a John le Carrier novel, but the plot is about to thicken. Due to the growing influence of the tabloid press in 1960s Britain, the story soon came out. The love triangle between the British cabinet minister, the Russian spy, and their girlfriend became headline news and a political scandal for the government of the day. Rumours of the affair between Keeler and Perfumo were raised in the House of Commons. John Perfumo, the British Minister of War, was hauled before his party to answer questions about the affair. Harold Macmillan, the Prime Minister of the day, was furious that the reputation of the government was at stake, both at home and abroad. John Perfumo denied having an affair with Christine Keeler. He lied. And later on, in a statement to the House of Commons, when he addressed them, he read out the same lies. The press and the opposition were determined to get to the truth. The minister, John Profumo, eventually confessed and made a public admission of guilt and resigned from the government. The Russian spy, Evgeny Ivanov, fled back home. The publicity around the case alarmed the Secret Service's MI5, who felt that Stephen Ward's intelligence activities and links to the Russian spy might be revealed. So they decided the best course of action was to hand him over to the police. Stephen Ward was charged with living off immoral earnings and his trial began in July 1963 and it was characterised as a, an act of political revenge for the embarrassment it caused the government. After a damning speech by the trial judge, Ward committed suicide before the verdict was read out. Ward felt he'd been made a scapegoat of the establishment and many of Ward's so-called well-connected friends didn't turn up to speak on his behalf. And MI5 didn't reveal the uses they made of Ward as a channel of communication to the Russian spy. In a separate trial later that year, Christine Keeler was found guilty of perjury and served six months in prison. She always insisted Stephen Ward was not guilty of the charge of living off immoral earnings that he had faced. The Profumo affair had aroused such national interest that seven months after the death of Stephen Ward, the Conservative Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, resigned. In the following year, the party lost the 1964 election to the Labour Party, who went on to hold power for the rest of the decade. So there you have it, two dramatic events that put Clifton House at the centre of British politics during the 20th century. Now that's quite some story for one house.